Hi guys, welcome back to another video. In today's video, we are getting ready to get a load of layer pellets in and get the grain store filled up. And I also made a start on our pond, um, so let's get into it. This is definitely one of the less glamorous jobs of farming. Um, I've got, there's maybe, oh, difficult to be spinning around. We've got about quarter ton, maybe a little bit over 300 kilos of uh, bird feed here left in the grain store. Um, well, actually, all in all, it's probably closer to a ton um, because I've already scooped in all of this here. And what I want to do here is uh, layer feed has come down in price a little bit. Um, it's 900 euros a ton right now. So I'm going to stock up. I'm going to fill up this room. So I got a bucket, all of this over here. And then we use this first and then we get our feed blowing in here then. Okay, that's our feet empty. We clean it out as best we can and we'll let it dry out. Um, there's little bits of damp where we were walking, but it will dry out. The feed won't be here for um, probably two more days. Our mill is well, it's about two hour drive away from here. Um, it's quite a bit away. Uh, so generally I'll tell them the week I need feed delivered uh, and then they'll kind of organize their trucks whenever they've got some more feed coming up here as well. They kind of bunch the whole lot in one load. Um, so that's how that works. So I don't generally get feed delivered on any specific day. I'm sure if I was really stuck, they would do it for me. But because I'm so far away from the mill and I'm generally only getting, you know, five, six tons, which isn't a massive order. Like a truck can take up to uh, 16 tons or 26 tons, depending on the size of the truck. Um, so I got to be a bit of flexible because I'm not a massive customer. But what I got to do now is I've got exit vents, so this vent exits outside and this vent here exits into the workshop and I've got to take this one out and completely block it because I don't want dust blowing into the workshop and I'm going to take the vent off the outside of that because my vent has a little fine mesh on it to stop flies or anything getting in and that will block up with dust straight away so what I do is I take the vent off completely for when the feed's getting blowing in and then once the feed's in here I put the vent, put the mesh back on. This here is just uh, pressure fitted in, um, nice tight fit, should be able to pull it off and as you can see there's a fine mesh inside and I'll just clean them off and the, the real reason I want to take it off the other side is because that'll block up straight away. So now I've got to cover up this hole which I have a board here somewhere, um, put on the other side, make my board good. A little piece of MDF. I've already got holes in it, so I just gotta match up these holes. That's it, get some about two minutes there trying to figure out which way this goes so it would be a good job for me now to write up on this so the next time I come here I don't waste two minutes job done and that's going to stop all the dust blowing into our workshop and then we change it off once we've got our full of green That'll let all the dust blow out here and hopefully do a good job. It's just a four inch sewer pipe with a four inch cover on it. And I'm gonna clean these off um, so they're nice and clean for the next load of grain. So the next job is to put in our filling pipe. I've only got one of these so I don't leave it in permanently. Um, I've got two tanks. Now this one is only used for storing um, table bird 
feed so broilers turkeys and we only need that in the summertime so I actually use it for storage uh, in the winter time but uh, sometimes I have my pipe hooked on going in here or sometimes it's going in here and the last time it was actually going in here so now I've got to reposition it and I clamp it on you can see I've got a clamp up here uh, because you can see what happens if I don't clamp it uh, it's like a uh, sandblaster nearly these pellets come flying out of it you can see where it was pointing into the roof one time and it started to eat into the insulation so I take off this clamp put in my pipe and then clamp it in and then it'll actually I'll show you when it's done it'll spin down to here and then the truck driver can just hook straight into it um, I could just get the truck driver's hose and clamp that in there but that's a lot of messing about when the truck driver comes um, with this here system I don't have to be here when the truck driver comes uh, he just clamps straight onto it if I left it up to the truck driver um, he would just throw it in there and it'll be bobbing about everywhere destroy the roof uh, so I find this is best um, it's just got these quick fittings on it and the truck driver comes and just slaps his pipe straight in there locks it up and off he goes it's actually the other side he hooks onto I've been doing pasture layers now for four years, five years nearly and I've been talking to a few of my friends and this who've been doing pasture layers for a while and they seem to agree. Um, when you're doing pasture layers, if you're doing it with a, with a hybrid bird, um, a high production layer, um, it's my opinion anyway that you can't really skimp on grain. Um, these birds are, they're like race cars, okay? They're, they're finely tuned to lay eggs and the minute you mess with them and if you mess with them in any way their lay rate will drop drastically and for anyone that's been to a pasture poultry training here on the farm um, I would have shown you the effects of that on the XL sheet and um, the minute you screw with the lay rate um, it very quickly becomes uneconomical um, so there's people talking about finding alternatives to feeding chickens you know feeding them uh, grains and uh, um, whole grains and this for me I've looked at it several times and it just doesn't work out um, your lay rate will drop pretty drastically and therefore then you'll be actually losing money as opposed to saving money um, now someone out there somewhere along the way will find a way of doing it I've no doubt but in my experience the only way pasture layers works is because they're an extremely productive bird um, and it's that high lay rate that uh, keeps it a profitable enterprise the minute you mess with the birds in any way they're so so particular you've got to keep them in that sweet pot sweet spot and i find that if you mess up with them in any way at all i wouldn't be surprised to see the lay rate go down to 50 percent um, and when you go down to 50 percent um, it doesn't matter where you're getting your your food source from um, it's it's not really uh, working and then I've also looked at the prospect of buying organic whole grains and, and processing them myself and the reality is um, a balanced layer feed is incredibly cheap in the whole context because of soy we, we can only get soy um, based uh, layer balanced feed here in Ireland um, there is no really alternative protein source layer feed so that's all we can get and soy is incredibly cheap um, when you start to look at it and like the price of organic whole grains um, in Ireland because it's not that big of a market um, but quite expensive um, so it kind of throws that out the window as well um, so that's just my thoughts on it um, you know I'm talking here from from I'm coming from the context of you know working with hundreds and hundreds of birds um, if you've just got 50 or 100 chickens that's a different ball game you know that's that's a different story but I'm talking about kind of like a, a decent sized enterprise three five hundred even a thousand layers um, if you're looking at that sort of operation I can't see um, too easy a way of reducing your feed cost uh, by cutting the corner because I think it'll come back to nip you in the ass um, but the best thing to do is take a look at the last video I put up about the Excel sheets do up your Excel sheets for layers. You know, put in your cost, your feed cost, put in your lay rate, and mess about. See if you get the grain cost down by X amount, and if the lay rate drops or if it stays the same, what is the outcome? If it drops, how much can it drop by before you start to lose money? Um, and you can play about. That's what I do, and that's where I've come to the conclusion. For me here on this farm, um, it it makes sense for me to stay with the balanced feed, and I can keep. I, it leaves me with an ultimatum if the price of feed keeps going up 
I can keep putting the price of my eggs up until the point where I price myself out of the market and then that enterprise is done, I've got to move on and find a new enterprise. Um, so that's the way I look at it. That doesn't mean that's the only way to look at it though. I've actually changed the plan. It's going to be easier to board this up first and then put our pipe in because uh, the boards will take a bit of the weight of the pipe. Pipe's a little bit awkward on your own. So um, I've got a lot of boards that are numbered to go along here and then I simply have these uh, one of the like 125 mil bolts that bolt into them. And I'm going to pull all these off and start to put on the boards. Pipes bolted in there, it's pretty steady. Um, I'll probably tie it up here a little bit, take a bit of the weight off here so it's higher up and it's easier for the driver to hook into. I just got to pack up these now. I've got a special board for the top, it's got a hole cut out of it, and we're nearly there. Give you a little update on the feeder. What I actually done was I took the mesh off from the top and now it just sits in, it's like literally sitting on top of the feed, just floats in there. And it seems to work fine. I'm not quite sure how it doesn't get buried by the feed coming down, but it must be like fluid dynamics. It stays floating. And so all I got to do is if the feeder runs empty, then it'll be on the ground and I lift it out, fill the feeder up and put it in. But generally, if I keep feeding the feeder, it just floats there perfectly and the chickens can easily get in. And as you can see, there's zero grain on the ground. So I think that's the solution. Um, it's working. It doesn't really make sense in my head, but it works. I just got, uh, I haven't ordered very much uh, plants this year. Um, I order most of my stuff from Future Forest. I find they're the best to deal with here in Ireland. Um, it's very hard to order plant stuff now. You basically need to order it this time of year, way before winter. Otherwise it's sold out in spring when you really want them. So you've got to order them now, get them here. Uh, it obviously doesn't work for bare root stock. Um, you're nearly at the point now where you need to put bare root stock in this time, this side of the winter, as opposed to spring when I like to normally do it. But uh, here I've got, I've ordered some grape vines. I'm hoping to put them into the polytunnel here. Now, if you follow us over the next year, it might very well be, uh, I think there's four grape vines in here. It might very well be how, how to kill four grape vines, but uh, I've been to some polytunnels that have beautiful grape vines trellised up high in them. And I think it looks really cool. And I'd love to get grapes so I could dry them out into raisins. Um, so, I've got four, know nothing about them. Gonna stick them in, try and figure it out and see how we go. They will obviously, if I put them in here, they will uh, shade out some of the tunnel, but most of the time, half of this tunnel we don't use anyway. We just keep it as kind of storage area or an area for doing tours in or whatever. So I'm happy for them to shade out that half anyway. Um, but everything comes well packed. And these are potted. So I just got to make sure they stay a little bit moist over the winter and the goats don't get them. And then in the springtime, we'll plant them in and figure all that out. I'm just testing out here. So I've just got two different varieties. Um, this one's already got a bottle of wine on it, so it must be good. Uh, but yeah, so the first, this is the first variety. Uh, and again, it's just by me reading the recommendations um, on the different websites and that's my second variety and i'm just going to give them a go and see what happens all we can do is learn today is november 17th and it's our first uh, frost on the farm not a heavy frost but uh, this is the first of the year really for us which is uh, very late typically um, but that's good for growth and um, a lovely crisp morning lovely sky the moon is still out Beautiful. Oh, it's been really cold this morning, um, but it's been really good because it's been 
we've had three days of really good weather dry and it's forecast to be dry for the next two days so it's time to get working on our pond and our plan here is i brought the tractor this is dad's tractor sorry the sun's right in your eyes um this is dad's tractor and uh, my own wood chipper and i got it all set up got a grease set up got everything the way i wanted here yesterday so this is my dad's tractor and my wood chipper and i got it up here yesterday evening I got it all greased and set up the way I want to run a few branches through. So my plan is to make a pile from the compost here over to Jess's house. And I've got to take all this, a lot of this is brush that uh, I'd gather up over the last few years of cutting trees down and just piling it here. And yes, this is making habitat, but there's loads of habitat up here. I'd rather turn this into a water habitat. So we've got two good days of forecast. So my plan is to get all this here uh, chipped up. It's going to take a while but it's good the ground's pretty frozen so it means I won't be uh, doing as much damage walking up and down on it and yeah let's get at it. Okay so it's actually day two um, I just got the head down yesterday and kind of got set up um, I've been chipping away here um, you'll be so surprised like how many how much trees you'll put through the chipper for the little wood chip you get because it compacts it all down um, this will be good, we'll probably use this for making compost. Um, it's not really good for bedding because it's too wet. Um, and so my little system here is a line. You, you need straight sticks to go through the wood chipper. If you've got a big fork in it, I think this guy here is actually probably going to be problematic. I need to come along and cut that. I don't know how I got into that pile. Um, but what I do is I pull out my wood and any of these guys that need to get cut, um, I lay them out here and I go through with chainsaw and I cut them all. And then the straight sticks go up here. Then I'll make two big piles around the wood chipper. It's a little bit of uh, multi handling the wood, but that's what you got to do. So I pull them out of the pile here. Um, any straight sticks go straight. And um, let's get back here. And I'm keep going. I'm trying not to fall over because so I got my pile of wood here. I spread them out, cut them up with a chainsaw and stack them all beside the chipper and then when I got a big pile then I'll start up the tractor. I don't like so much noise. Um, I'm, I don't need to do this in like fastest time possible. I've got loads of time so what I like to do is don't like the tractor running too loud so what I do is build up a big pile then turn on the chipper, chip it all. Then what I'll do is multiple times I'll come I'll spread out all branches here, cut them up because again I don't like running the chainsaw uh, needlessly as well and then build up this pile so I'll, I'll pull them out of here a few times till I got a big pile here and then we'll chip it. And what I'm also doing is any big timber, this is a four inch wood chipper, I'll show you the chipper in a minute, but any big timber like this I'm keeping because I want a lot of these, these have been sitting out here in the woods for, and out in the rain for at least a year, you can see a lot of them are already inoculated with fungi so there's fungus all through that which are breaking it down starting to rot away you can see loads of them here and what i'll do with these is i'll take them off into the woods i've actually got a spot can earmark way up in the woods up there and i'll just build habitat with them here i've got a little fire going um i've had had a pile of off cuts of wood um that were in this corner and i can't be sure there weren't screws or nails in them so um just it was really cold so i just started with fire and my plan with there's actually loads of wood that i chopped so i'll dry that out and it's going to be probably a really nice um starry night tonight so i might keep the fire going today and come up tonight and watch some of the stars I'm drying my gloves here too um but that's basically my process and uh, i just keep going and going and going until i get rid of all the wood my wood chipper this is a uh, little PTO driven wood chipper and it's very straightforward uh, you hook up to the PTO there's two bearings either side and there's a big uh, basically like a big flywheel with blades in here and this is can take up to four inches pull this out have a look in it's quite difficult to see it you can just see one of the blades passing there and they turn round and round and round and then this is turning this way so with the centrifugal force then it can blow the wood chip up the spout and then you can change the angle here you can also change the angle the spout is at i do it with one hand not really if we, if we can see we can turn the spout this way now we can turn them back 
where I had him and he just locked into position. Um, really handy piece of kit. You would normally blow it into like a trailer, so it's got a tow bar for a trailer. I bought this brand new like two years ago. Um, it's a handy little piece of kit to have. Um, and yeah, it's great for taking because these guys take up a lot of space. Like you can see the space those bushes take up, takes them a long time to break down. Um, now you do have to burn a bit of diesel, but you can turn it into this, which then we can incorporate that into our compost. Um, it's a little, if I blew this into the polytunnel for summer, then I could use it as bedding because I would dry it out. Still quite, I don't know what the moisture is of it, but it's quite high, uh, too high to use as bedding. But the other option why I got this is I could blow this into a polytunnel uh, for and leave it sitting in the polytunnel for a summer and that would dry it out good uh, and then you could use it for bedding so there's loads of multiple uses there um, nothing to it now but for me to get out of it and Jess is quite funny <laughs> she uh, sits in the pile here <laughs> like a lunatic when it's blowing out trying to grab all the sawdust just getting sawdust absolutely annihilated in her and her barking like mad at it but she finds it quite fun and I find it fun watching her so <laughs> that passes a bit of the time. We find an old football down there and Jess just thinks it's the best thing ever. You ready? You ready? It's a real hard one too she can't uh, she can't bust it. <laughs> Happy doggy. So the reason why I wasn't using night protection is because my eye protection is fogging up like hell today and uh, I can't really see anything with them so I need to get better eye protection. And so this isn't, uh, you manually feed this one, it isn't uh, fed with a hydraulic roller. Um, you go up a couple of thousand euros for the hydraulic roller fed system so you do sometimes have to shove them in. But physically impossible for me to reach the blade like I'm still about three foot away from the blade. And I typically like to feed it and stand with my face to the side so if anything does shoot out, um, it's gone out that way. But not terribly expensive, great little uh, tool on the farm and yeah, it does the job. And just at the back, this is uh, going to be the back of the dam. Um, so the plan is that's where we're clearing the tree, the bushes out of. And the plan is to build up this here dam, uh, probably quite high, higher than Jess, right up high. It depends how far we want to flood back, but I'd like to build this up and we're going to take our pipe out through here. Now I've got to figure out, this is all mainly um, rain runoff. I've got to figure out what's the maximum flow that I can expect coming through here so that I can size um, the outlet pipes accordingly. And so I want to figure out how many litres per second are coming out of here. So I'm looking for a nice place to put in a funnel and I'm thinking here's a good place. If I can funnel the water where I can get a bucket and underneath it and measure it accurately, what I'll do then is we're in the middle of winter now, so when it's been raining for a few days straight and this is really coming at roughly what's going to be its hardest, I'll take some readings from that and then we'll, we'll use that as data to figure out what's the maximum flow of water that's going to be coming into this. And I'll also I'll put in a fail safe, like a, a spillway as well to take like a freak event um, but I want to just kind of know what the general run of the mill is so we cater for that and then we'll cater for the kind of one-offs um, big range big rain events uh, my plan for that is we're going to have you know at least maybe two foot higher the dam two foot higher than the outlet so there's going to be quite a bit of capacity to store water in there 
and let it go slowly but also in that dam i think i'll put one of these um big 12 inch pipes uh, as an overflow maybe like a foot from the top and run it down here as well um, that's what i'm thinking at the minute so i've just popped in this little board and now the water's coming out in a nice funnel for me and then i can get my bucket in there and i can measure this So I pop my bucket in pretty much like this here. I count five seconds and then I've already done this. And once the five seconds pulls up and uh, I've got measurements in my bucket, I've done that five times and I've got a flow of right now there's 2.6 liters per second. Jeff, come on in. Jeff, come on. Right now this is a flow of 2.5 liters per second. Um, and a four inch pipe should take away four and a half liters per second i'm thinking about putting in two four inch pipes so i think that's definitely going to do this no problem it's been raining uh, pretty consistently for the last two days and uh, given a lot of rain this week so i'm going to check this on and off now during the week after really heavy rain see what i can get the maximum out of this uh, but i'm pretty confident now my two four inch pipes going to handle this no problem and i'm actually going to build in a third uh, overspill, so I'm pretty confident it'll be fine, but I'll keep an eye on it. I've just set up a new paddock for the goats. Um, I'm giving them about five days in each paddock at a time now. Uh, it's just more efficient for setting it up, so that's where we came out of. And now we're moving into this now. This isn't, I wouldn't say it's fully recovered by any means. I was actually supposed to go to the other farm for a month. But I just couldn't have been bothered driving up and down every day. It's about a five minute drive. Uh, I'll do it after the Christmas. Um, so this really should have another month to recover, but it'll be totally fine. Um, grass growth has completely slowed down now. Um, we'll graze it over it. The goats aren't taking that much off it anyway. Um, you can see from up here, they're just kind of picking. They're going to rushes and stuff like that. They're getting some hay uh, when they go in at night as well. But uh, I'll go to the, I'll let this fully recover then for spring growth and should be okay. I think we'll be all right. Time to go let the goats out. So the goats, I just put a post down like this here and I'll walk up and jump over. Now one thing I find with the goats is you have to make lanes for them. Uh, getting them, if you want to go in and out of the polytunnel, you could go in and out a hundred days straight and think, oh, they got it, I don't need the lanes. They're going to run everywhere on you. The only two times I find that you don't need the lanes is if it's absolutely lashing rain, they'll go straight for the tunnel. Or if it's really getting dark at night, um, they'll go straight for the tunnel. Um, so you don't need the lanes. But outside of those times, it's just worth putting the lanes up because they just, the devils, they all have their own characters. And there's some, look at them, they're all here mad to get out. Come on, let's go, let's go. And it's not that they're hungry, they just want to go out for a nose because they know it's not raining. So, let's get them out of here. No. Come on. Come on. Let's go. I haven't gotten doing too much uh, sh sheepdog work with Jess. Um, it's just been pretty wet and didn't get around to it. Come on. Let's go. Let's go. Hop. Let's go. It's hard this time of year to keep them from being lame. Um, I just pair their feet, uh, bathe them in salt water, and it tends to heal them up. It takes a couple of days, uh, and you just get one goat sorted and someone else becomes lame. It's really down to the fact that uh, the ground's so wet and they're not used to it. I mean, I could also maybe keep them in the polytunnel for a while, but they keep on crying to get outside. So that kind of breaks my heart. Uh, so I let them out. Come on. That's them. We'll graze off here for the next probably four to five days. Another project I've been meaning to get done is I've got a, like a 1300 litre tank around there I was going to use to catch the wastewater out of the poultry slaughter, but that's not going to be needed. So 
I'm going to position it here and catch the runoff off. This is a huge big roof up here. Can't get these up high enough, but there's a lot of runoff off this roof, so I want to catch it here. But I want to get it high enough so it'll be able to gravity feed the polytunnel. And I have another job where I'm going to want a source of uh, clean, unchlorinated water. Um, and I'll probably be using it inside in the in the other side of that uh, tin there. So the plan is to build this up. Um, I need to get up probably up to in line with those uh, screws and then it'll be able to gravity feed into the polytunnel. It worked out pretty good. Um, well, six inch, you just slipped a four inch in there and it's not bad. I mean, this is level as I'm going to need it. And I can try and give you a comparison of the height. You can see the floor of the polytunnel to the level of that. Let me see there now. We should be able to feed the polytunnel from here because generally there's going to be the water's going to be actually four foot higher than this. Uh, so there's going to be a little, little nice little bit of pressure to do the polytunnel. kerosene but uh, I cleaned it out pretty good now it's almost a year ago um, but I'll flush some water through it as well just to make sure it's clean and I'm just checking I want to make sure my intake up here is low enough to get water out of the gutter and it's going to be close here's my tig out here and I think that's probably where I want it Got my tank up there. I turned it round so this was nicer and the level will actually work. Uh, I've got this piece of downpipe which fits it. Uh, well it did a minute ago. There. But I don't have a 90 that fits that to take it off in that direction. So I've changed the plan and we're just going to jerry-rig this little piece of gutter uh, to run from there over and it'll work. I've got this gutter running now and it's pretty good. I just need to tie it in place. And then I got to put some sort of filter on that side to stop leaves and debris that'll go on the roof, comes through the gutter. And I don't want it building up in this tank, so we've got to put some sort of filter on the end of that. I'll just grab some one break or something and get that done. I'm just giving the gutter here a good wash out with a lot of leaves and everything, so we're getting cleaned out. And that means hopefully there'll not be as much crap going into our tank. And just get her filter on. Now, that's our simple filter, just a piece of one break doubled over, and the water will flow in there and it'll filter out any leaves or debris. And I'll come along and clean that maybe once a month and it'll be totally fine. That's all the fun I have for this video. And uh, I think over the winter, because there's not so much happening in the farm, it's a lot of slower creating content. I think maybe every other video I'll do like a more of a in farm planning, how I run the farm video, then just what we're doing on the farm, vice versa for a few months now, or well, a few months for the next two or three months, um, just because there's not so much happening on the farm and I ain't going to be making content for the sake of making content, so you're just going to see what I'm doing. So I think the next video maybe we'll take a look at the, something around the, the planning of the farm, uh, just to show you basically how I do it in my head. That's all I'm showing you, um, and everybody's different, but uh, I love seeing how other people do stuff, and it gives me ideas and things I can try out, so I'm just putting it out there for the, the same reason.